And so what happens when we use positivity in a way that is not beneficial for us, we end up suppressing our emotions, which we know is not an effective long-term strategy to deny how you're feeling, say it doesn't exist, pretend otherwise, those feelings are going to show up one way or another down the road, probably in a way that doesn't feel good. That was Whitney Goodman on Psychologists Off the Clock. We are three clinical psychologists here to bring you cutting edge and science-based ideas from psychology to help you flourish in your relationships, work, and health. I'm Dr. Debbie Sorensen, practicing in Mile High, Denver, Colorado, co-author of Act Daily Journal and an upcoming book on Act for Burnout. I'm Dr. Yael Schoenbrunn, a Boston-based clinical psychologist, assistant professor at Brown University, and author of the book, Work, Parent, Thrive. And from coastal New England, I'm Dr. Jill Stoddard, author of Be Mighty, The Big Book of Act Metaphors, and the upcoming Imposter No More. We hope you take what you learn here to build a rich and meaningful life. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. We're proud to be sponsored by Praxis, the premier provider of continuing education training for mental health professionals. Right now, Praxis is offering both virtual and in-person trainings. And for the virtual trainings, they have both live and on-demand courses. Praxis is our go-to for evidence-based CE trainings, and they're especially known for their ACT trainings. Some of the best expert peer-reviewed ACT trainers offer courses with Praxis. Check out their current offerings at praxiscet.com, or you can link to them through our website, offtheclockpsych.com, and you can get a discount on live training events if you use the code OFFTHECLOCK. I'm here with Yael to introduce today's episode with Whitney Goodman, where we talk about toxic positivity. And this episode was really well-timed for me. It was it was eye-opening, honestly, because it made me realize that with all the incredibly difficult things that have been going on in the world over recent years, I think that I've been a little bit guilty of maybe like wanting or needing more positivity in in my life. And anyway, it made me really stop and and wonder if given that relationships are incredibly important to me and it really matters to me to be able to show up for people I care about when they're having a hard time. So it just got me thinking a lot and I'm wondering what your reaction to the episode was, Yell. Well, I think it's such an important conversation to be talking about toxic positivity cuz it it's not that positivity in and of itself is problematic. It's problematic when we can't make space for what's hard. And I think what you're pointing to is something that so many people feel. So I'm glad that you shared it, which is life has been really, really hard. And so it may in part be that we're drawn to toxic positivity because we're just so tired of all the hard things. The other thing it makes me think of though, Jill, is you and Whitney later in the episode talk about help rejecting complainers and how hard it is to listen to people who are having a hard time, but just aren't able to kind of turn the page, you know, if they vent and share what's hard, that they kind of feel stuck there. And if you listen compassionately um, for a time and then are you're ready to kind of move on to think about, you know, for example, if you're in the therapist role, okay, and, and so what can we do? What are lessons learned? What can we make from this? How can we grow? That certain individuals take a lot longer, sometimes based on circumstance, to be ready to move forward. And that can be hard to be in the listening role. And so it got me thinking about this fine art that we have of being therapists and sort of doing that piece of validation and offering compassion and this sort of sense that we develop as therapists of when it, when we are ready to kind of push somebody into figuring out and what do we do with it. And I, I think it's one of these things that's really hard, even as a therapist, to figure out when to push versus when to kind of sit in that compassionate listening role. Yeah. And if it's hard for us as therapists, imagine how hard it is for people who don't have the same kind of training that we do. But I do think that there are just very human ways to show up and attend to whether a conversation is what someone needs or not. So for example, active listening, noticing someone's body language, does it does it seem like they're kind of turning their head away or not making eye contact or are they leaning forward and nodding their head? You know, you can pay attention to people's signals. Or one of the things Whitney talks about is you can ask. You know, you can say like gosh, this sounds 
really challenging. I can see exactly why you would feel this way. Would it be helpful to brainstorm some potential solutions or do you feel like you just need me to listen right now? I think where it gets tricky and maybe the case with the more sort of chronic help rejecting complainers is if there's a real function to the complaining itself and it doesn't ever kind of turn to problem solving. And and just having this conversation now, Yael, you're really making me realize I think that's where my bandwidth gets low and where I struggle and maybe want to like, you know, turn the volume up on the positivity. People will sometimes say to me, I can't, how could you be a therapist? I can't imagine listening to people complain all day. I'm like, no, no, that's a real misconception about therapy because people aren't complaining. They're coming and saying, I'm stuck. Something's not working. Help me figure out what I need to do to change and be proactive to make my life better. I can sit and do that all day, every day. It's almost more like in my personal life, if I have people like, I, it's a silly example, but I joke, if you come to me and you complain incessantly about your bad haircut, at some point I'm going to be like, oh my God, then go fix it. Like go get, <laughs> right? It's like, like this is a problem that you can solve. Like maybe there doesn't have to be quite so much negativity without action. If that makes sense. But then it sort of gets to this question. I mean, you sort of said the function of the complaining. I think even in our non therapy relationships, and maybe especially in those non therapy relationships, to get curious for yourself, maybe even to pose the question of it sounds like you're really unhappy and not ready to make a change. I wonder why. Mm. And I do think, I mean, just as an aside for all those mental health professionals listening in, it is very hard to not step into supportive problem-solving mode as a therapist because that is what we do for a living. But I think, you know, it's something that I think about a lot to sort of leave my therapist hat off when I'm in my husband-wife relationship or when I'm with my friends because typically in those relationships, people just want a supportive year. They're not coming to me for help the way that they are in therapy. Yeah. And the main thing that we talk about in the episode is the best way to be able to show up for that is to make room for our own discomfort with people's struggles. Like, so this is the part of the the origin of toxic positivity is I feel uncomfortable when you share your pain. And in order for me to feel better, I'm going to sell you platitudes like it's all good, you know, keep calm, carry on, whatever those things are. And that that's invalidating and creates disconnection. And that if we can learn how to sit with our own discomfort, even with help rejecting complainers yeah. and make space for that and focus on the the connection, the friendship, the relationship, whatever it is that's that's important, you know, that that's one way that we can overcome the the problems with toxic positivity. It makes me think of the parenting advice that when your kid is having a really hard time, even if it makes no sense to you that the less helpful responses you don't have a reason to cry or everything will be fine or don't worry, don't be sad, right? And Because that is about your own discomfort, exactly as you and Whitney talked about. And I think that is why this toxic positivity idea is so helpful in so many of our relationships, in our friendships, in our therapeutic relationships, in our parenting relationships, in our partnerships, where when we notice that response of trying to shut down discomfort to really get curious about, you know, whose discomfort is it that we're trying to shut down? And if it's ours to maybe get curious about that. Yeah, exactly. Well, we hope you get a lot out of this episode with Whitney Goodman. Hey, everybody, it's Jill here, and I'm really excited about our guest today, Whitney Goodman, who wrote a new book about toxic positivity. And you may be familiar with Whitney. She has a very popular Instagram account, called Sit With Wit. So I can't wait to have this conversation today. Whitney Goodman, LMFT, is the radically honest psychotherapist behind the hugely popular Instagram account at Sit With Wit. She's also an author and the owner of the Collaborative Counseling Center, a virtual therapy practice in Florida. Whitney's debut book, Toxic Positivity, Keeping It Real in a World Obsessed with Being Happy, shows readers how to shift the goal from being happy to being authentic in order to live fully. A millennial on a quest to make mental health information accessible and easy to understand, Whitney helps people who want to improve their relationships and emotional wellness. She earned her undergrad degree at Tulane University and a graduate degree in counseling psychology from the University of Miami. 
Whitney has a column in Psychology Today and has been featured in several publications, including the New York Times, Teen Vogue, New York Magazine, and Good Morning America. Whitney, welcome. I'm so happy to have you here on Psychologists Off the Clock. Hi, thank you for having me. Of course. So let's jump in. So the book is about toxic positivity. So it seems like the right place to start is what is toxic positivity? And can you give a few examples for us? Toxic positivity is the unrelenting pressure to be happy or positive, no matter what the circumstances are. And it's something that we can use against ourselves and other people. So some examples of that would be when anyone is struggling or going through a hard time, we meet them with something like, just look on the bright side. Everything happens for a reason. It's all going to work out. You have nothing to worry about. And we can also do this to ourselves, right? Of saying things like, gosh, I should just be grateful. I need to just be more positive whenever we are struggling with something. It seems like this is something that has become, it's just like sort of exploded, maybe especially with social media and the growth of kind of like quote unquote wellness experts or gurus who may or may not actually be (laughs) experts or gurus. Um, so how can positivity, I think most of us think of positivity as a good thing, right? Like, shouldn't I be positive and optimistic and think, so how is it that it can be toxic? Like talk to us a little bit about what happens when people either say it's all good. Don't worry about it. Or we do that thing to ourselves. I should just be more grateful. What, what, what are the repercussions of that? I think you're so right about social media. We live in a very black and white world, and that tends to be where our thinking goes. And so we assume if if positivity can become toxic, then we should just be negative. And there is this middle ground, right? And so what happens when we use positivity in a way that is not beneficial for us, we end up suppressing our emotions, which we know is not an effective long-term strategy, right? To deny how you're feeling, say it doesn't exist, pretend otherwise, those feelings are going to show up one way or another down the road, probably in a way that doesn't feel good. Mm -hmm. The other thing that happens is that it really inhibits connection between us and, and other people. Because if I feel like you're denying how I feel, you're telling me it's wrong. I'm not going to go to you anymore. And I'm going to suffer in silence. And I think that we see this on on a really bad scale when we think about people who are dying, you know, because of mental health issues where they feel such a deep amount of shame and this feeling of like, I'm the only one that's struggling with this because they're met with that positivity. Yeah, absolutely. There, there's. I think the Surgeon General not too long ago came out with a report about this like epidemic of loneliness. Yes, that people are experiencing, and that's what that makes me feel like. Is you know when you are brave enough to share that you're having a hard time, and it's met with "it's all good" or at least this look on the bright side. You know that that can actually make people feel really alone and prevent them from sharing again in the future. Exactly. I also love that you say it's like a Band-Aid on a bullet wound, mm-hmm. right? I mean, that like yes. that is so, that's a great metaphor. And I think that's exactly right. And the other metaphor I think of is when you talk about emotional suppression and how it comes out one way or the other is um, my co-hosts and I all do a therapy called acceptance and commitment therapy, which is very consistent with the messages in your book. Mm-hmm. And one of the metaphors is about like, you know, when you have a floating ball in a pool, like when you were a kid and you would try to get the ball under the water and it takes all your effort and energy and attention, it's hard to do, but eventually you can get it under there. Right. But what happens, it pops up 100% of the time. And the further you push it down, the higher it flies up in the air. And that this is, you know, kind of the metaphor for emotional suppression. That ball is going to fly up. And the further you stuff it, the more it's going to come up. And what if we just sort of like let it float, Mm -hmm. you know? And sometimes it'll be crashing into our heads and it'll be really, it'll be right there in our awareness. Other times it'll be on the other side of the pool. But we're now freed up to use our arms and our legs in other ways, because that emotional suppression often takes a lot of energy and effort and attention to try to, to, to do that and sustain it. So true. I love that Uh, metaphor. Yeah. The other thing you talked about that is you actually talked about some research in your book that this toxic positivity can like it works specifically can stunt creativity 
which that was new to me. I hadn't really thought about that. Is that, can you say more about that? How does it stunt creativity? Yeah. So there was a lot of interesting research on groupthink and how that can be promoted within the workplace. And when people are subjected to that type of culture, they really don't want to do anything to step outside of the lines, right? Because there are repercussions for that, whether it's social stigma or getting fired. The other part with creativity is that when we are trained to not look for problems, we can't find solutions. And so what they found with a lot of work environments, especially in creative industries, marketing, et cetera, like people need to look at the negative parts. You know, that's how we're getting new technology. That's how we're, right. uh, you know, getting those like app updates on our phone and all of that is because somebody complained um, or said, this isn't working for me. And I think we have to credit most of the big innovations in our world for somebody speaking up and saying, this could be better. Yeah. Right. And and you have to be able to see the, the pain points. You know, if yes. you have these like positivity blinders on, then you're not aware that there actually are these pain points that need to be addressed. Yes. Yeah. So the flip side of this, of course, we'll talk much more about the toxic part of positivity, but the flip side of this is you do acknowledge that positivity can be a good thing. So what does healthy, non-toxic positivity look like? Like, how is it different from toxic positivity? The best way to describe this, I think, is using radical acceptance from dialectical behavioral therapy that we can hold space for conflicting things at the same time, right? And we don't necessarily have to like it or accept it. So healthy positivity to me is saying, I acknowledge reality. I don't like this part. This part is hard, whatever it is. And I have hope for the future and that things could get better. And bringing in that empowerment piece of like, how can I utilize my resources, my skills, my abilities to improve things in some way? Yeah, I love that. We in ACT, we talk a lot about workability, which is the idea that like, does whatever it is that I'm doing in this moment, does it does it help me move closer toward the person I want to be, the life I want? So if there is something that I'm choosing to shift my perspective on and have a more positive or optimistic outlook, and it's not having any of the costs of positive toxic positivity, I'm not suppressing my emotions, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, and it's maybe even making it more likely that I'll engage with my values, then maybe that can be a good thing. But really looking at that, like almost like the function of it more than how it appears topographically, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's a great way of looking at yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. So this concept of toxic positivity has become, it, it's like a little controversial. And so I'm curious what you think, like, why do you think it seems to both resonate with so many people, myself included, but it also gets some weird pushback, yeah. right? Like, so what, it, what do you think that's about? So I think we have to remember that like positive thinking is almost like a billion dollar industry that has been operating for a long time within the self-help and psychology space. I mean, early in my training, like that was really part of a lot of the rhetoric, right? It was changing yeah. negative thoughts to positive thoughts. And so when people have been, I hate to use the word like indoctrinated, but really just like exposed to something continuously mm -hmm. over time, I think there's going to be pushback. There's also people who make their money um, by pushing forward this sort of rhetoric. Mm -hmm. And I think it can be challenging to go up against and be like, ah, maybe this isn't working. But that's the, the thing that I always come back to is that we have been trying this for such a long time. And mental health outcomes are continuing to get worse and worse. So mm -hmm. we need to try something new. Yeah, it's such a good point. It's such a good point. And, you know, the other thing it makes me think of is you can see why the, the pushback may come from these sort of larger systemic or organizational kinds of places, because like you said, there's money to be made. And you talk about this in the book, too, is like at the individual level, people want to have certainty, they want to have control. Yes. And they think like, if I can just shift my mindset here, then I can you know, like, like I'll be able to, um, pursue this happiness, right. That like, and they think that the pursuit of happiness is going to give them certainty and control. 
Um, but it, but it, like you said, we've been trying this forever and it really just doesn't work, but it's, it's hard to get people to give up that idea. And you tell a story in your book about one of your clients. And I was sitting there going, yep, me too. I had a client just like this. It was like, no matter what we did, I really struggled to get her to give up the idea and not based on what I was telling her, but based on her experience is this rule you have that I must be positive all the time. Like, how is that working for you? Where Mm -hmm. is it not? What is the cost? How is it keeping you stuck? And oof, I really struggled. I couldn't get her there. Yeah. It's, it's really challenging. And I've seen that type of rhetoric manifest in almost like OCD type Mm. symptoms where the feeling of like my thoughts have to all be pure and positive and good or something bad is going to happen to me. And I think that's echoed in a lot of like the positivity literature of like, think positive thoughts and good things will happen to you. And when something then bad happens in that person's life, it's like, they feel like it's their fault. Oh gosh. Like with manifesting exactly, or the exactly. secret mm-hmm. or what's the other one you talk about it in your book. That's like that, the manifesting, the secret, the, there's the power of positive thinking. Yeah. Um, the secret. There's another one that's basically magic, you know, magical thinking that like, yeah. if I just put yeah. it out into the world. This is what's going to happen. A law of and attraction. I, a law of attraction. That's yes. it. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. Yes. Um, and yes, and I've actually had a couple of clients who struggle with OCD and those are the exact things that end up mm-hmm. turning into compulsions. And then it's like, if anything's going wrong in my life, it's my fault. It's that I'm just not like thinking positively enough exactly. about it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's so sticky. <laughs> <laughs> and then I think the other piece too, you know, at that, that individual level, and you, you alluded to this earlier is that people sort of wrongly think that the opposite of toxic positivity is negativity. And they're like, well, I don't want to be a negative person, you know, and there's, it's, it's the, it's the black and white thinking, right? The lack of seeing this as a more sort of nuanced and fluid kind of concept, the both and aspects of it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I I think there's a really uh, big gap between toxic positivity and being negative all the time. It's not like you have to pick one or the other. Right. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the function of this, because I think this is really important. And for any of us who want to change some of our behaviors, I think it's important to recognize the role they play. Like I always say it works or we wouldn't do it, right? Like procrastination works. We can all say cognitively, like, oh, I know procrastination is bad. Well, it works or you wouldn't do it, right? And the moment you give yourself permission to put off a task till tomorrow, you get relief. Of course, tomorrow you have just as much to do and less time to do it. So in the long run, it is not beneficial, but in the short term, it works. And so I think this this idea with toxic positivity, it has a function for those of us who do it to ourselves, and it also has a function when we do it to someone else, Yes. right? So if you're saying to me, gosh, I just had a really hard morning and I had this other interview and I think I blew it, and I was like, oh, don't worry about it. I'm sure you did fine, right? And now not only are you already feeling anxious and worried. Now you feel bad about the fact that you're anxious and worried because I just told you, you shouldn't feel that way. Right. Exactly. But what is, what is the function for me? Like, why do so many people feel compelled to go, Oh, I'm sure you did great. Don't worry. It's all good. And you know what? At least you didn't like totally make a fool of yourself on camera. You know, (laughs) there's a couple of reasons why I think we do this. One is that it feels good to be able to solve problems, right? We want to make things better for other people. There's a little bit of that like ego-driven desire to have the solution. And I even come up against this often as a therapist, especially early on in my career of like, gosh, if I can just find the right thing, you know, to fix this for the other person. We also are confronted with a lot of difficult feelings when people are going through hard things, particularly things like grief, loss, where we might be confronted with our own mortality or the fact that our parents are going to die. And so in order to avoid those hard feelings, we just want to shut it down and and move away from it, which I think is, is the other part is that sometimes people are just trained to say these things because it's all they heard and they don't really have other words. I don't think it's always like 
ill-intentioned or, or mean when people are saying these things at all. Mm-hmm. I think probably most of the time it's not. It's probably exactly. very well-intentioned and there's just a lack of awareness that the way I'm responding to you in this moment is actually less about you and more about me. Mm-hmm. That I'm having a really hard time sitting with your grief or your pain or whatever it is. And so I'm going to do whatever I can to try to just like create a, an easier space for us to to exist in. So, you know, we all know how important relationships are and, and research just continues to support that really like the most important thing to our overall health and well-being is that we have quality connections with other human beings. And so to that end, I'm sure we would we would all like to be able to respond to other people's pain in a way that isn't invalidating, that doesn't bring toxic positivity into the dynamic. And, you know, of course, not all of us are trained therapists who maybe (laughs) have been actually taught how to do that. So do you have some like thoughts or tips that you can give our non-therapist listeners, you know, when other people come to them with pain, what do they need to watch out for to make sure they're not doing that toxic positive, toxic positivity thing? And what can they do instead? If you're looking for a great way to support us here at Psychologists Off the Clock and make your life easier and healthier, you should go to my new favorite online store, Thrive Market. Thrive Market carries all your grocery and household essentials with the convenience of getting everything online and then quickly shipped right to your door. And right now you can get 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift if you go to thrivemarket.com slash POTC. I love that I can use specific filters to curate my shopping experience so I can find organic meats and low sugar snacks for my kids. Plus, when you join, they give to a family in need. How cool is that? So join in on the savings with Thrive Market today and get 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. Go to thrivemarket.com slash POTC for 30% off plus a free $60 gift. That's T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash P-O-T-C, thrivemarket.com slash P-O-T-C. I know I talk about my kids a lot, but I also have two adorable dogs, Tilly and Hazel. We love to spoil them, which is why we love Whole Life Pet. Whole Life Pet makes single ingredient treats, meal mixers, supplements, and hydrating snacks for both dogs and cats. And if you try out Whole Life Pet, you're surprising your pets with fun new flavors while also supporting psychologists off the clock. Visit wholelifepet.com and use promo code POTC to get 25% off your first order with free shipping over $50. When I open the Tuscan Blend Bistro Bowl Meal Mixer to add to Tilly and Hazel's food, they start wildly sniffing and can't wait to dig in. The best part is Whole Life Pet uses a freeze-dried process that locks in nutrients and freshness, and they never add chemicals, additives, preservatives, or anything artificial. Visit wholelifepet.com and use promo code POTC to get 25% off your first order with free shipping over $50. If you're unsure about what to try, you can fill out their short questionnaire by clicking the red Start Today button on the home page. It will ask you a few questions and make custom product recommendations for your pets. Visit wholelifepet.com and use promo code POTC to get 25% off today. Yeah, so I'll speak from the perspective of someone that you're close with and you have an established relationship with. I think the first thing to do is to start seeking understanding, which is what a lot of therapists do early on, right? We're asking questions. We're trying to learn more about the problem. We want to make sure that before we offer any type of advice, solution, opinion, that we really have a sense of what's going on. And I look at toxic positivity as being a really simple solution for a complicated problem. So you're trying to get to know that complicated problem. From there, I think it's really about validation and empathy and thinking about how can I show this person that I'm listening to them, that I understand what they're going through and that it makes sense to me, you know, why they're struggling. So saying, I hear you. I get why you're upset. Uh, This is something hard going there. And then from there, if you're trying to move into an action stage, I think this is where we can be really collaborative with people about thinking about what can I offer? What boundaries do I have? What skills do I have? And what does this person need from me? They might just want you to listen. They might not want any type of of action, but you can really discuss that with them and, and try to make it a mutual process. Yeah, I think that's something we skip over all the time. It doesn't seem natural to say like, 
what do you think, how can I be most helpful to you right now? Like, do you feel like you just need me to listen? Do you just want to vent? Or are you looking for me to try to like brainstorm some solutions with you? And often, sometimes a person will say, I, I don't know. <laughs> but I think a lot of times they know, like, I just want you to listen. Maybe later I'll ask you for solutions. And, but that we skip that step. It's not, it's not the natural next thing to say, like, how can I, how can I be helpful? And I think that first part, you know, I think that's a really easy shift that people can make. And just to give like a simple example, if someone were to say like, um, oh God, I'm really nervous about this job interview. You know, our instinct might be to say like, oh, don't be nervous. You'll nail it. You always do great at these things. That's Mm -hmm. clearly well-intentioned. I'm trying to make you feel better. But I feel invalidated because I'm already nervous, right? So you telling me not to be nervous is not helpful. If instead a person said, well, of course you're nervous. This is important to you. You want to do well. Yeah. Right? Like, oh, gosh, that makes me feel so much calmer. And it's like you said, I now feel understood mm-hmm. and seen. Mm-hmm. And and now we can go from that. Now, if you want to tell me, you know what? I have a feeling you're going to do great because you have a way of being able to you know, speak about your accomplishments that is really impressive, right? And it, you're going to be more open to be able to hear that if it's led by that initial validation. Absolutely. And I think, you know, asking about like, oh, do you want to talk about what parts you're nervous about? Do you want to talk through <laughs> like what you're worried about? And from there, we can give more targeted like responses based on those things. Of If someone's saying, oh, I'm worried about getting up in front of people and presenting something. Oh, well, I remember that last time you did that, you did a really great job. Like mm-hmm. what worked before you prepared for that and trying to have a conversation instead of just fix it. Yes. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Curiosity can be helpful here, exactly. right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So what about the flip side of this? So we're talking about how if I'm the listener, I can respond in a way that isn't rife with toxic positivity. If I'm the receiver of someone's toxic positivity, I'm sharing with you that I'm really nervous about this job interview and you're telling me like, oh, don't worry about it. You're going to be fine. How might we respond? Like, is there a way? I know there's a way you talk about it in your book, but (laughs) how do we give people feedback that maybe that's not what we need? Mm -hmm. If it's somebody that, again, you're in a close relationship with, I think the place to start is to validate that they're trying to help you. So to say, like, I know you're trying to be helpful. I know you want to support me. And that's not really what I'm looking for right now. That doesn't really help me right now. And then if you can, offering them a way that they can be helpful. So I would love if we could talk through why I'm nervous or can you just sit and listen while I vent? and trying to give the person something tangible that they can do. Yeah, that's great. And then it's not, you know, you don't want to shut the other person down because you're just saying you're doing this wrong, (laughs) you know, right? You're not giving me what I need. You know, that's not going to make them better at being validating and supportive when I'm typically that I'm sure is what people want, right? Mm -hmm. In the service of having a solid relationship. Yeah. I love the way that you talk throughout the book about, um, how like often the whole toxic positivity thing, it like puts the onus or the blame on the individual, right? Like you should just be able to be happy all the time. And if you're not, you must be doing something wrong, which of course, like totally ignores the role of environment and culture and systemic influences context. Right. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I'm a big uh, systems thinker. And so I don't think that we can really look at the individual at all without looking at that context that you mentioned. And most of the positivity literature, I think, places an overemphasis on our thoughts and leaves everything else out of the picture. So whenever you listen to an interview of someone that was successful, right, they really overemphasize a lot of the time, like, well, I just believed I could do it and I did it or I manifested it. And it distills it down into this really quick, easy thing. And we're leaving out of the picture, like, you know, what did you have access to? Who was supporting you? Did you have student loan debt? Uh, Where did you live? What's your health status? Like, there's all these other things. Are your parents involved in your life that I think actually we see through research has a tremendously large impact, even more than our thoughts right. on people and their level of success. Yeah. Right. And so then like, what do we do with that? 
I think it's something we can get curious about, right? Like we can try to integrate that into our understanding of how our life is being shaped, how other people's lives are being shaped, and try to remember that we cannot give these simple little platitudes as a way to fix people's lives or to understand them. Like there's just way more nuance to that. And I think as consumers, we have to remember that when taking in any type of self-help or psychological information of like, this is just a snippet and I need to apply this to the greater context of my life. Right. It's so much more complex. There's all these other layers and, you know, if you're not thinking positively, you're not, you know, if, if thinking positively isn't working, you're not doing it wrong. There's a heck of a lot more to it than, Absolutely. than just that. Yeah. So kind of along those same lines, it seems like another buzzword we hear a lot these days is burnout and for good reason, right? Like it really seems like burnout is just at an all time high and we see workplaces <laughs> trying to fix it by offering yoga or mindfulness But the expectation is that then employees will like just keep smiling and stop complaining. And so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about toxic positivity in the workplace specifically, and then what can the the individual or the employee do? And what can those of us who are leaders do to not fall into this kind of trap? Toxic positivity is rampant in the workplace and and for a good reason, because I think for leaders, it's it's much easier to work with very positive, agreeable people, right? But we know that that's not helpful or effective, especially in certain industries. So I think for employees, it's important to develop a language and assertiveness and boundaries that you can implement in the workplace, um, finding allies that you can speak to about what's going wrong and, and finding a way to mix, I think, professionalism with also sharing when things have been upsetting, unfair, or discriminatory even in certain Mm -hmm. situations. For leaders, I definitely recommend like having a set aside space where people can echo complaints, where they can share things that have been going wrong for them. I think the reason people get dismissed so much or are told to stop complaining in the workplace is because there's no place for that stuff. And so maybe it's being brought up at moments where it doesn't fit. And that person is seen as taking away from the agenda or pulling the focus onto them. And really it's because they're just trying to be heard. And I think if they felt validated, understood and heard, we would see a lot less of that. And then of course, the last piece is like actually making structural real changes in the workplace that support workers that are legitimate, such as like paid time off and making sure that there's fair practices happening within the workplace. Healthcare, things like that are so much more effective than a mandatory webinar about mental health, you know, when people are already working 12 hour days and they're exhausted, like that's not going to help. Well, and in a way, like some of those webinars, and I've led many of those yeah, webinars, sure. you know, in a way they they even lend more to this toxic positivity thing because it's yeah. like, let me teach you skills for how you as an individual can be less stressed, which actually means more happy because, you know, as a, like as a supervisor, I just want everybody to smile and not complain because that makes my work life easier, right? So it's like continuing to put the onus on the individual to, and not that there's anything wrong with self-improvement, right? It's not this black or white thing as we've been saying, but to strictly put the onus on individuals that like, listen, if you're not happy, it's because you're doing something wrong. So let me do this webinar to teach or yoga or mindfulness, you know, to teach you these skills so that you can just like calm down and get happier and smile. And then we'll all just be much better off at work. Right. I mean, it's really yes. problematic. No, they're, they're certainly ticking off a box, right. Of like we acknowledge mental health. I actually mm-hmm. had a situation where I was supposed to speak at a law firm and I told them like, I will speak about the workplace's responsibilities as well. And then they were no longer interested in having <sighs> the talk. So I think there is definitely a pressure to just talk about the individual and what they can do, you know, to manage their time and get better sleep. Yeah. Wow. That's fascinating. I mean, that's not proof in the pudding right there. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Wow. 
Right. And I think the other uphill battle here is we are so reinforced for positivity, especially at work, right? When you're, and I've told this story, I think, on the podcast before. Maybe I wrote it in my book. I don't remember. But um, when I was in my graduate school program, I was, you know, in a back office at the clinic, not in a place where any of the clients could hear or see me or anything. And, and I was laughing. And the person who was kind of in charge of the clinic came and like got after me, like sort of yelled at me because I was laughing too loud. I'm like, oh, oh, okay, I guess that's not professional. And then fast forward a handful of days, maybe a week later, and the same person gave me feedback that I wasn't smiling enough, that my face was, you know, like too serious, right? Mm -hmm. And I like it was, you know, aside from the problem of this like inconsistency of like, oh my God, I don't know what to do with my face and my voice because everything I do, I do is wrong. (laughs) But I do, I mean, maybe that's not a great example because I was getting yelled at for laughing, but I do think in general, we get really reinforced for smiling and being positive and not complaining. And it feels good to be liked or rewarded or, you know, it's like, there's, there's just a lot of heavy reinforcement for doing that and often punishment when, especially for women. I mean, how many of us have been told we need to smile, sweetheart? You know, you look a lot cuter when you smile and when we play nice and we're agreeable and, you know, nobody likes a complainer, which I also want to ask you about. Yeah. So it, it, it can be an uphill battle for sure. So Let's talk about a couple specific tips, and then I do want to come back around to complaining. So if we're letting go of toxic positivity, right, this means we have to, like, accept that to be human is to experience painful emotions. So, like, we're not going to beat ourselves up if we're feeling grief or anxiety or sadness, And we have to allow ourselves to process the emotions that arise. And so I think a lot of people genuinely get that in theory. And, you know, in addition to all the toxic positivity we see in social media, I think there is a decent, maybe not balance, but also a smattering. The the information is out there that it's important for us to feel our feelings. Like what's that phrase? The only way out is through, you know, Mm -hmm. there's some of that there too. So, so even if there is buy-in, okay, I get it. I'm not supposed to stuff my emotions down. I need to let myself process it. I think where a lot of people get stuck is like, Uh, okay, but how, right? Like when am I supposed to have time to do that if I'm working and then taking care of my kids and like, how do I even process my emotions? And you give a number of really good tips in the book about exactly how to do that. So can you give us like one or two of your favorites or that you think are the most powerful ways that, that they can engage with and process difficult emotions? The first place I like people to start is really just getting in touch with what feelings feel like in their body. I think most people that come to see me, feelings for them are thoughts. They're like disconnected with how they're manifesting physically. And when you can start to get in touch with that, I think you have a little bit of a leg up on getting ahead of the feeling. So what does anxiety feel like for me? What does sadness feel like? And how can I be aware of that manifestation? The other thing that I think is really helpful for people to do is to learn how to label their feelings and to develop a wider vocabulary for those emotions. So you've probably seen a lot of those like feelings wheels online. I know for a lot of my clients, they might be able to identify like happy, angry, sad. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't feel great when we don't have a lot of other language for our feelings. So just trying to get a little bit more granular can be very helpful. Okay. So getting in touch with the feelings. So really like in a way being kind of mindful, like getting present and even recognizing where I feel this in my body, what anxiety feels like for me physically, and then labeling that feeling. This is fear. This is despair. This is anxiety. And then is there anything else like other than just like, do we just sit with it? Is there anything else that people can do to, or, or even to realize, uh, like if, if our sort of default is to stuff, is there a way to know that, that we're doing that or kind of like to do the opposite? Yes. So when you're somebody that's prone to pushing things down, I think you have to find ways to allow yourself to move through the feeling and like discharge some of that in some way. So some ways that you can do that are definitely talking about it, like in the context of therapy or with a friend, writing about it can be a great expressive strategy or any type of like art 
creative pursuits. And then thinking about like, how can I move my body while I'm working through this emotion can be helpful. So sometimes I tell people, you're going to pair the uh, feeling with an action, right? So I'm going to be anxious and I'm going to go on a walk. I'm going to be anxious Mm. and I'm going to go to this yoga class. And so we're not denying the feeling or trying to get rid of it through that thing. It's more just like, how can we use this activity to help us walk through that feeling. And a lot of the time we experience a decrease by doing that. Right. Where the decrease isn't the goal, but it is often the outcome. And, and sometimes, you know, that phrase, the more we resist or wait, what we resist persists. Yes. Right. So it feels like the feeling is the problem, but often it's the, it is the suppression of the feeling that actually makes it greater in frequency or intensity or duration. Yeah. I like to use a kind of like using the breath as a vehicle to allow emotion. So I think a lot of people are taught to use the breath to force relaxation, right? Like, okay, do your deep breaths to get rid of this anxiety. And what I, this is, this is actually from acceptance and commitment there, but, but you know, where you inhale, you physically make space, right? Your lungs expand, your body expands. So to use the breath as a way to expand, to like make space for whatever you're feeling. And when you exhale to let go of the resistance, so not to let go of the feeling, not don't exhale and try to make the feeling go away. I mean, try it. It's not going to work. It'll come right back, but sort of letting go of that unwillingness to have it. So inhaling to make space up oh, here you are. There's nothing I need to do here and exhaling to let go of the resistance. And that, that seems to just give a little bit more like wiggle room, mm-hmm. you know, and that, that, that one, I think I, I like to lead clients in that as a closed eye exercise, but I do it myself all the time. And with practice, it's now something that, you know, even if I'm driving with my eyes open, I can take one breath. And I'm sort of there, you know, it like sort of cues it because it's something that I've practiced enough times. And it's a slight difference, but it's different to breathe as a way to process emotion versus to breathe as a way to try to make the emotion go away. Yes. I love that approach. I love that you devote an entire chapter to complaining. (laughs) Obviously, you know, I love it because humans complain, right? We all complain here and there. And I'm sure we all probably know someone who complains a lot and might not like to listen to that all the time. So I thought we could talk a little bit about like, what are the benefits and drawbacks of complaining? Because there are some benefits to complaining. And like we were saying before, everything has a function. It works or you wouldn't do it. But there also can be drawbacks. So let's talk about benefits and drawbacks and then maybe like how we can complain more effectively. Yes. Complaining is definitely a way that we build connection. I'm sure anyone listening can think about a time when they've been sharing, complaining about parenthood or whatever it is, the traffic that day, and it makes you feel closer to people. It's also a way that we can get our needs met or create change. We talked about creativity before, and I think complaining can work in a lot of similar ways of like, I have to identify what's wrong if I'm going to change it. Mm -hmm. Now, the dark side, of course, is that if we complain too much or our complaining isn't effective, we're not getting our needs met, it can often become very circular and we get stuck in that complaint loop. And then it causes disruption, you know, for us and for our relationships, because it can be difficult to tolerate for extended periods of time. Yeah. Especially you talk about the help rejecting complainer. You know, we probably all know someone like that. So that's the person who complains to you frequently. And when you offer suggestions to help them solve whatever it is that they're struggling with, yeah, but yeah, but yeah, but, you know, it's the, I want to just keep complaining and complaining and never actually do anything to change my situation. And I think that specific brand of complainer can really take a toll on a relationship. And similar to what you were saying before, like we like to be able to solve problems. We like to be able to feel like we're helping, right? And that it, it's, you know, it can feel um, exhausting and like maybe being on a treadmill, but not getting anywhere. If you're constantly talking to the friend who's complaining about the same things over and over and rejecting any of the, the helpful suggestions that you make. Yes. 
And and that's also a piece about like, I find that people who complain like that a lot often just feel unheard and maybe like they don't want a solution. I think when someone is in that help rejecting complaint cycle, that that's also a, a cue for us to maybe step back and be like, maybe I should just listen, or maybe I need to set a boundary with this person if I feel like I cannot listen to them or help them. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Okay. The other thing I want to ask you about is you, you have established this gigantic social media following. And I'm curious, like what, actually, let me ask you this. Was I, did I read it correctly in the book that like, are you credited with coming up with this term toxic positivity? So I'm not sure if I did or not, but I did create the first like social media post about toxic positivity that went viral in 2018. And that's really what led to this book was just creating that chart that I like made on my office floor on the way. Okay. Right. And so then was, did you have a large social media following before that? Or is this really what kind of triggered your like big Instagram platform? Yeah, I did not. I had just recently started my private practice and I was like, oh, Instagram's free. I'll start writing some stuff on there. I think I had, I don't know, maybe a thousand followers at the time when I put this up and it got picked up by a lot of like news outlets. And so then Uh... things started to grow from there, but I never intended for Instagram to get to the level that it is, it just has spiraled into being such a big part of my career. I mean, it's so interesting because that really goes to show how much this concept of toxic positivity really resonates with people. You know, that maybe people are sick of all these social media accounts that are telling me to don't worry, be happy. It's all good. Keep calm and carry on or whatever <laughs> other, <laughs> other crap is out there. And I, I love that you've, you know, you put content out that's helpful for people and that you, were you approached to write the book or was it something that you decided to do and then send a proposal in? I was approached to write a book. And at the time I was still pretty young. I was like, gosh, I can't write a book like before I'm 30. I need some more time. (laughs) So I just kind of pushed it off. And then like two years later, I was like, wow, this toxic positivity thing has continued to grow. So I decided to put a, a proposal together and I went back to the publisher that originally had contacted me. Got it. Well, I'm so glad you did. It's a great book. It is chock full of value while also being really accessible. You know, I love that it's, at least for me, I think all of us have diminishing attention spans. And so, you know, to have a book that has a number of bullet points in it and subtitled, like it's just, it's easy to read both physically and to absorb intellectually. So I highly recommend it to people. Um, I know people can find you on Instagram at sit with wit. If they want to learn more about you or find the book, where else can people find you? Yes. You can find me on my website, sitwithwit.com. Um, my book is sold anywhere books are sold. You can also find links to it through social media on my website. And of course, we will link to all of this in the show notes. So Whitney, thank you so much for being here. It was so great to talk to you. Thank you for having me. Hey, Psychologist Off The Clock listeners, I'm going to guess that if you are listening to this episode that you love to geek out about books in psychology. So if you are a fellow book nerd like Yale and I, and all of the people around you are tired of you talking about books, then you can join us once a month to really take a deep dive into the the books that we're going to be reading together. So if you want to join us, all you have to do is send an email with the subject heading RSVP to offtheclockpsych at gmail.com and we'll send you information for upcoming meetings of the book club. We hope to see you there. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. If you enjoy our podcast, you can help us out by leaving a review or contributing on Patreon. You can get more psychology tips by subscribing to our newsletter, and you can find us wherever you get your podcasts. Connect with us on social media by going to our website at offtheclockpsych.com slash merch. We'd like to thank our strategic consultant, Michael Harold, our dissemination coordinator, Katie Rothfelder, and our editorial coordinator, Melissa Miller. 
This podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only and is not meant to be a substitute for mental health treatment. If you're having a mental health emergency, dial 911. If you're looking for mental health treatment, please visit the resources page of our website, offtheclockpsych.com.